Hi, I'm Peter. This talk is based on some ideas that have been bubbling around in my head for a long time. And I first articulated them at an ISRR talk at the end of last year. And then I worked with my colleagues and students, Faraz, David, Nico and John, to try and put them into some kind of sense. And that's written in an archive paper, which is listed here. This talk is a shortened and hopefully more concise version of these long bubbling ideas. For the last seven or so years, I've been director of the Centre for Robotic Vision. And we have researchers who self-identify as com computer vision people and researchers who identify as robotics people. And it'd be my great hope that we would create a cohort of people who identified as robotic vision people. Uh, these were people who applied computer vision to problems in robotics. Well, what's occurred to me over all of the time that the center has been running is that computer vision people and robotics people are really two very different kinds of people. And it's not just the conferences that they go to or the journals they publish in. It's not just the matter of CVPR versus ICRA or ICCV versus RSS. There's fundamental differences in what these different communities value and the methodologies that they apply in their research. So in computer vision, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what counts are papers with tables of bold numbers. And I guess for a long time I was a little skeptical or dismissive of tables of bold numbers, but I think it actually indicates a very important underlying methodology and it's something I think we can learn from. And it's, that's one of the main things that I want to talk about today. Robotics, we say we value experiments and we know that it's hard to get a paper published in ICRA or IROS unless you've got experimental results. But I'd argue that what we call experiments are not really experiments. And I think that's the other big theme of what I want to talk about today. I look somewhat enviously at the progress that I see in computer vision. Uh, you know, the last decade progress has been astounding. So computer vision today is remarkably good at understanding what's in an image. Uh, we can convert huge numbers of pixels into, into classifications, detecting regions and labeling them. It's remarkably good at estimating difficult geometric characteristics just from pixels. So we can estimate the pose of objects, we can reconstruct depth uh, from color images, we can compute surface normals and so on. Computer vision is also remarkably good at understanding, whatever that might mean, what's going on in an image. So we can do image captioning and we can even now ask questions of images and get answers that, are, that depend on what we see in the picture. So these are all amazing to me uh, manifestations of progress in computer vision. We're also able to say something quite profound about the state of humans. Uh, we can uh, compute skeletons of humans. Uh, we can estimate gender. We can estimate age. It wasn't always this way. Uh, so if we consider ImageNet, and I'll talk a bit more about ImageNet shortly, and we look at the competition results over time, error rates were pretty high, 25% uh, or more up to the year 2012. And then we get this very low ball uh, number, actually impressive low error rate. And this is really the first application of deep convolutional neural networks, the famous AlexNet paper in 2012. And since then, progress has just improved uh, monotonically, it's gotten better and better. Uh, we're building uh, networks that are deeper, that are more sophisticated, We've got all sorts of tricks that we've learned over the intervening years. And for me, this is a very powerful indication of progress in the field. So progress was definitely driven by lots of good quality labeled data. And the ImageNet was a project uh, started by Fei-Fei Li uh, back in 2006. And it's a huge number of annotated images. So that's a ton of data that deep networks can use to learn from. But it's not just ImageNet, and I think there are a few other factors that often go uh, unremarked. Another factor, I think, is standard performance measures. And in uh, the, the field, MAP, 
uh, is an agree widely agreed performance measure. We may not love it, it may not cover all aspects of performance, but it's certainly a standard widely agreed on and people can rigorously compare their results using that particular measure. There have been competitions and competitions get people's competitive juices flowing and led to significant progress. The other one I think is zero delay dissemination. Using tools like Archive, people are able to post their results and they're read by uh, their colleagues all around the world the next day or the next week. And that gets uh, them thinking about a way that they could improve on the result that was just published. And they'll do some work and they'll publish a result and disseminate it through Archive. So instead of the sort of long latency that occurs in publication through traditional journals or even through conferences, this uh, zero to say delay dissemination has really speeded, speeded things up. So these three other factors, I think, have really added fuel to the fire that started with a deep learning technology and a large amount of data that's available through ImageNet. So in this talk, I'm going to make a number of assertions. And the reason I make assertions is, is that there are specific things that you can argue uh, with me about during the Zoom session. So assertion number one is that standard data sets plus competitions plus rapid dissemination leads to awesome progress. Assertion number two is that data sets without competitions will have minimal impact on progress. And I think this comment is really aimed at folk in our field who, public, who want to publish data sets uh, in the hope that it will push robotics forward. We have some important data sets in robotics, uh, particularly in the SLAM sub-community. But in general, I think there are too many people pushing low value data sets. Just because it's a data set doesn't mean it's going to push our field forward. Uh, so I think you need to be very selective, very careful with a data set uh, if, you want to, if you want to publish it, if you want it to have real impact. So what might Picasso do? Now, referring here to his quote that good artists copy, but great artists steal. One thing we could do is we could just copy, a shallow copy if you like, and we could put a deep learned perception system on a robot. And we're doing that. That happens a lot these days. I think almost every vision system on a robot today has probably got some deep learned uh, algorithms uh, on, uh, the, on the other side of the camera. The thing, the other thing that we could do is to steal wholeheartedly the whole methodology that the computer vision people have cooked up and which I've argued is very, very effective. So that's standard data sets and competitions, metrics, rapid de dissemination, the whole kit and caboodle. But as roboticists, we've probably got some strong objections to that, to all of that, or to parts of that. So one is, does the image net performance that people are getting, the bold numbers that they're putting in tables and papers, does it actually translate to real world performance? Is top five or MAP really a good performance measure? Robots work in the physical world, so if they make errors, there are real consequences. So finite error rates are gonna be very problematic. What about uncertainty estimates? We want to perhaps have uncertainty uh, or distributions over the location of objects in the scene as well as distributions over their class. So perhaps the most important one, most significant one, is can a data set driven methodology, which is definitely what the computer vision people use, can that be applied to embodied data? Now, can we use that for closed loop sensor driven system? A big objection to using image databases is that they are not like the real world. The images in the image database are completely independent of the action. So the problem that computer vision people are interested in is to take a random picture and to classify it. But for a robot, images are coming to us in a sequence. There's a small amount of change from one image to the next. It's really important temporal information that's actually getting lost uh, and perhaps incredibly valuable. Another problem is that image databases are very sparse and they have all kinds of bias. And two of the most obvious forms of bias is they contain lots of pictures of things that are easy to take pictures of, like the Eiffel Tower from, all, from a number of different directions, uh, but probably very few from up high or above. Uh, but they perhaps contain you know, very few images of environments that are on fire or the Antarctic, other places that are very, very difficult to get to. But I think the most important distinction between what the computer vision folk do and what we do is that their research is driven by evaluation. 
and we say that our research is driven by experiments. So here are some sort of dictionary definitions of evaluation and it's a systematic assessment of the performance, the operation of a system compared to some standard. An experiment by the book is a scientific procedure that's undertaken to make some discovery, to test a hypothesis or demonstrate a fact. And a hypothesis, again by the dictionary, is a tentative or testable answer to a scientific question. It's a prediction that we can test. So when we say we're doing robotics experiment, what do we actually mean? What hypothesis are we actually testing? And so I think perhaps too often the hypothesis we're testing is that my robot will work. And I'd add uh, that perhaps it would work once under poorly specified and non-repeatable circumstances. So I think a lot of the things that we put in our papers are not really proper experiments. And this is a cause for some concern and I think should be a uh, topic of a lot of conversation within our community. And it's growing. There is a big push towards uh, repeatable r robotics research. Uh, that's very welcome. It needs to be a much wider conversation. So the, the difference between experiments as interpreted by roboticists and evaluation is that evaluation says something quite firm. It says my algorithm works X percent better than another algorithm with respect to some performance measure. To make it work well, we need to remove lots of confounding variables. And in robotics, we have lots of those. The type of robot, the environment the robot's working in, and the task that the robot is doing. Well, we can use standard platforms to help factor out the robot variable, some examples of standard platforms, and we can use standard environments to factor out the environmental variables. Uh, they can be from competitions, and we can have standard tasks that put the results on an equal footing, and many tasks have an implicit performance measure. Take the Amazon Robotics Challenge, for instance, there were very rigorous performance measures teams um, aim to optimize. So assertion number three is that to drive progress, we really need to change our mindset from experiment to evaluation. But the performance of any sensor-based robot is stochastic. And really every time you run your robot, you are conducting an unrepeatable experiment. And that sounds rather odd, but when you think about it, for a robot that's driven by sensory information, the noise on the sensory signals means that the robot on its very first, on its first time step, is going to take a signal, which has got some noise on it, it's going to perform an action. So at the next time step, its position, its pose, is going to be slightly different, which means with the viewpoint plus sensor noise, on the time step after that, it's going to be at a different location in space again. So we've got sensory noise uh, with cameras very definitely, and with LIDARs, with gyros and IMUs. The other thing we can't control is the initial condition. So every time we put our robot on the ground, we really can't guarantee uh, that it is the same pose as it had last time. I mean, if you try and line up an image to get the pixels right, you've probably got to get the orientation of the order of micro radians uh, and the position perhaps to microns. Uh, and that's really not the sort of thing that we do in robotics, may not even be possible. Now, we can use simulation to perform repeatable evaluation, and that allows us to compare different algorithms on the same robot, the same environment, the same task. It's easy to do in simulation. It allows us to estimate the distribution in algorithm performance due to sensor noise and the initial condition. We can see how they affect uh, the performance of the algorithm. And we can determine the robustness of algorithm performance due to changes in environmental factors. So we might have an algorithm that works really well in time. In simulation, we can dial the sun down, uh, add shadows, remove the leaves from trees, and see how well the algorithm performs in those sorts of circumstances. The other big win for simulation, I think, is in regression testing, that if I make a change to my robot, uh, how do I know it's still going to perform as well as it did before? Maybe I've changed the code to improve one thing, how, sure, how can I be sure that I haven't broken some other thing? So we think we can use simulation to enable rigorous evaluation of robotic systems. But more importantly, we can use simulation and competitions to recruit more people to think about our problems. So in our lab, we've been working on competitions, robotic vision challenges, uh, which put down, throw down the gauntlet to the 
to the computer vision community and say, hey, you th if you think you're good at computer vision, come here, work on real computer vision problems where the computer vision problem is embodied in a robot. So we created a bunch of tools to make it easy for computer vision to use robots in simulation and we've created competitions on the eval AI platform and we've got a leaderboard all the sort of things we need to do to get people's creative juices flowing so assumption number four is that we can use competitions and new metrics to nudge the research community to work on problems that we think are important and if we set it up right make it easy uh, add some sort of reward or incentive structure hope that we can get some of the amazing performance the computer vision people have been able to achieve for problems that are robotic and get those applied to problems in robotics now assertion number one was this and I think it's actually too simple and so I'm going to cross out competition and say it's actually it's about an evaluation methodology it's about recruiting lots of smart people to work on the problem and it's very definitely about rivalry. Now the problem for us in robotics is that the number of people who can play is orders of magnitude smaller than it is for the computer vision community. Uh, perhaps simplistically I'm going to say that for making progress in computer vision you need smart grad students, open source software and a bunch of GPUs. You're done. Right? You can get to it. In robotics we need uh, the smart grad students definitely. We need open source software. But then we need a whole lot of tools like ROS and Ubuntu and Python and all sorts of packages and we have version hell and we need a robot and sensors, a place for the robot to play. We need the smart person in the lab who knows how to make stuff work. We need a lot of patience and a lot of time. For all of those reasons, the number of people who can play in robotics is sadly very small. So another thing that we've done in our lab is to create a minimalistic API for vision-based robotics. It works with a simulation platform I talked about just a moment ago. It also works on real robots. And our dream is that uh, researchers can upload an image uh, with whatever operating system they like, whatever perception system, whatever algorithms they like, and can run it on our robot and get results uh, from a robot operating in the real world without having to have a robot, without having to have the smart people, the space, all those other uh, constraints. So, last slide. Uh, a number of assertions are on the left-hand side there that we can have a conversation about later. And here are some resources uh, to the Robotic Vision Challenges. We have two Robotic Vision Challenges now. Uh, in, uh, there's a link there to the BenchBot interface, which is our simplified API for robotics. And there's a link to the archive paper. Look forward to having a conversation soon. Thank you.